This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. A new international report shows how over 150 million children have been pushed into poverty by COVID-19. South Africa to effect coronavirus level 1 regulations from the 20th of September. And the head of Libya's government of national accord fires Al-Saraj says he wants to quit office by the end of October. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment. But first, here's Rama Nyang with the day's business headlines. Rama. That's right, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa's central bank pauses its rate-cutting cycle as the economy reopens as pandemic restrictions are gradually eased. South Sudan's president finds the country's eighth finance minister amidst an economic meltdown in Africa's youngest country. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And let's begin with the latest on COVID-19. The pandemic has drastically changed life for children around the world. Those living in poverty have been hit even harder. A joint report by UNICEF and Save the Children is shedding light on the issue. As Tatal has the details. From distance learning to wearing masks, children have had to make incredible adjustments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Those living in poverty or low-income households have been hit even harder. A joint report by UNICEF and Save the Children is highlighting the dire situation. According to the report, there has been a 15% increase in children living in deprivation. This means an additional 150 million children have been pushed into poverty. This brings a total to 1.2 billion children living in deprivation globally. The report puts forth suggestions which look beyond just fiscal remedies. This includes providing children with the necessary tools to take part in distance learning. The CEO of Save the Children, Inger Ashing, noted that the pandemic has caused the biggest global education emergency in history, adding that it would be hard for vulnerable children and their families to make up the loss. The report also suggests increasing access to quality health care as well as family-friendly policies like paid leave. Astatal, CGTN. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has announced that the country would move to COVID-19 Level 1 regulations. The action will be effected starting midnight September 20th, nearly six months after the pandemic was announced in the country. CGTN's Angelo Coppola has more. Ramaphosa reminded South Africans that more than 15,000 people had died and over 65,000 had been infected in that time. But since the July peak, the situation had improved although the economic position had gotten worse, leading to a 16% GDP contraction in the second quarter. Just as we have acted together to defeat this virus, we must roll up our sleeves and get to work rebuilding our economy. We have a mammoth task ahead of us. The president confirmed that an economic plan was in the pipeline, with the cabinet due to ratify it in the coming weeks. What? What worries me uh, in hearing about a new plan is that we've had lots of plans in the past and uh, those plans have consistently fallen short uh, of promise and in recent years that difference between promise and delivery has got wider and wider. As the country prepares for the new normal, there was also good news for the international tourism sector. We will be allowing travel into and out of South Africa for business leisure and other travel with effect from the 1st of October 2020. This is subject to various containment and mitigation measures. Travel may be restricted to and from certain countries that have high infection rates. A list of those countries will be published and it will be based on the latest scientific data that we will be able to get. 
Um, we're cautiously optimistic because we do know that there's a lot of detail that still has to come out. And so therefore, one of the things that we're looking for is we know that the individual ministers will be making um, uh, presentations and will be issuing directions to support the level one. So an important aspect for us is to, to determine what is on the list in terms of the, of, the, of the states that are going to be allowed to fly in here. And I think reciprocally as well, they, they've also got to be wanting to accept us as uh, South Africans flying into their part of the, of the world. But analysts say implementation of such plans is crucial if South Africa is to forge ahead during these difficult times. South Africa sits uh, structurally stuck. That, uh, and one of those uh, structural constraints is an absence of confidence and an absence of delivery in policy promise. Both of those capabilities sit in the hands of, of the policy makers. The president has called for South Africans to roll up their sleeves because we need to get that economy kick-started again. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Meanwhile, Uganda has launched a clinical trial involving the use of convalescent plasma to treat COVID-19 patients. Convalescent plasma therapy involves taking blood from a recovered COVID-19 patient and injecting it into someone who's critically ill. The blood carries antibodies which could help the sick fight off the viral infection. CGTN's Michael Baleke has that report. <laughs> Uganda's health ministry says administering blood plasma therapy will speed up the recovery of COVID-19 patients. The treatment comes at a time when the country is registering a spike in cases. COVID-19 has no treatment. What is given currently is supportive. So having convalescent plasma come on board is great. And we are looking forward to it being started tomorrow. Figures from the Ministry of Health show on average Uganda registers two to three deaths per day from COVID-19. And this number is expected to rise as total infections jump past the 5,000 mark. This is forcing health authorities to explore different options like blood plasma therapy. What we are doing is we are getting these antibodies from healed people and give these, them to this person who have not yet made his own antibodies and neutralize the virus in real time. And where these, some studies have been done, there is dramatic improvement in symptoms when these antibodies are given. Convalescent plasma has been trialed as a therapy in coronavirus outbreaks in countries like the United States, India, South Africa, and they have reported improvements in patients. Health authorities here say initial trials show plasma therapy is safe and has proved to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19 patients. But scientists argue more research is required to prove its full efficacy. Medical researchers in Uganda working on the project say getting survivors of COVID-19 who are willing to sign up and donate blood is a challenge. To treat one person, we need two donors right now with the methods that we have. Because our methods we are using now is the traditional way of collecting blood, separate out plasma. Now there are advanced technology which if we got one person would treat one person because that technology when you take out you take out only the plasma the rest of the things you put them back. Other anticipated risks include survivors having secondary infections like hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV among others. Recovered COVID-19 patients will be required to contact a blood bank or a nearby hospital that treats COVID patients to donate the plasma, which could potentially save lives. My Kobaleke, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Officials in the United Arab Emirates are reporting encouraging results from phase three trials of a Chinese vaccine. And pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, also in the late stage trial, says participants have shown mild to moderate symptoms from its vaccine. Timothy Ulrich finds out more about the race to create a vaccine. Five out of nine vaccine candidates in phase three trials are from Chinese companies and are being tested around the world. 
The UAE gave emergency approval for one vaccine to be administered to frontline workers earlier this week. It's one of the candidates in late-stage trials developed by Chinese pharmaceutical company Sinopharm. The UAE is reporting positive results so far. The country's National Crisis and Emergency Management Authority says no severe side effects have been encountered. Another candidate by Chinese company Sinovac is entering phase three trials in Turkey. For some, the progress has been cause for optimism. Wu Guijin is the top biosecurity expert at China's Center for Disease Control. As early as November or December, ordinary Chinese people could get the coronavirus vaccine, as results from phase three clinical trials so far have been very successful. And officials say it won't just be a win for Chinese people. President Xi Jinping said earlier this year if the country finds a vaccine, it will be shared with the world. COVID-19 vaccine development and deployment in China, when available, will be made a global public good. That's in contrast to how vaccines are being bought already, even though they haven't been produced. A report by Oxfam published on Wednesday found over half of the world's future supply has already been bought up by wealthy nations, making up 13 percent of the global population. Chinese companies aren't alone in their success. U.S. pharmaceutical manufacturer Pfizer is reporting mild to moderate side effects to its vaccine in late-stage testing. Its CEO announced earlier this week it could be available later this year if successful. And AstraZeneca, in partnership with Oxford University, said over the weekend it would resume trials after a participant in phase three trials showed adverse side effects. Timothy Ulrich, CGTN. In Kenya, the number of COVID-19 infections has dropped drastically to less than 100 daily cases over the past few days. Normally, this would be a reason to celebrate, but as CGTN's Robert Nagila reports, that reduction has nothing to do with the flattening of the coronavirus curve. Today, we have only 48 people who've tested positive. That's the lowest number of new daily COVID-19 cases reported by the government in the past five months. From highs of eight to 900 cases a day in July, the number of daily COVID-19 infections has dropped to the mid-40s in September. Neither is the country's health system overwhelmed, as earlier predicted by models, despite an initial surge in hospitalizations, partly due to the implementation of a home-based care system. So, is Kenya flattening the curve? On the streets of Nairobi, you'd be forgiven for thinking so some semblance of normality has returned. Many have taken this as good news. The pandemic, they say, has forced unplanned changes on their lives. You no longer meet with your friends to have a talk or to go out partying with friends. Things are very expensive. The economy is so high because it's now it's double the fare that you're paying. So me, me, It stopped my social life. Now I just work. But it's too early to celebrate. The reason for the low number of positive cases, the government says, is due to reduced testing for reasons beyond their control. These commodities for testing are rather scarce and they are in high demand globally. So that supply chain is not very stable. Experts say the country is also facing a challenge with its contact tracing system. There is little to no contact tracing being done. And so you find that the cases that uh, have been in contact with some of these uh, patients who present are literally not tested. And that, they warn, is a ticking time bomb. So the ramifications of that is that you have much more people floating around uh, who are infected, but may not even know that they're infected. And so they're literally spreading it out um, throughout the entire population. The government expects testing equipment to arrive in the country later this month. Until then, they hope, the public will strictly follow social distancing guidelines. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Chinese President Xi Jinping visits a central Hunan province. And the head of Libya's government of national accord fires, Al Saraj, says he wants to quit office by the end of October.
Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's head over to President Xi Jinping's inspection tour in central China's Hunan province. In a village in Wusheng County, President Xi met with villagers and visited exhibition centers and a local clinic. He also paid a visit to a primary school where he joined a class about history of China's revolution. President Xi talked to the students about their role in the future of the country. <laughs> I think you will rejuvenate China. You're now like saplings. We're nurturing and watering you. We will be protecting you from rainstorms, and you will eventually grow into big trees. There will be a big forest of the Chinese nation, a forest of talents. Kids, study hard and make progress every day. China says the jobs market in Xinjiang has been improving. A new government white paper says employment there grew by 17% last year, compared with five years ago. It says workers have also enjoyed a steady growth in their income. The document says more than 480,000 new jobs were created in urban areas last year, and about half of them were for women. Meanwhile, Xinjiang's public services in employment has also been enhanced. Last year, there were more than 8,000 community-level job agencies with over 21 million service requests processed. The report also says China has been working to protect human rights and firmly opposes forced labor in Xinjiang. It says the efforts are in line with China's constitution and international labor standards. Seiram Lake, one of the icons of Botala, Mongol Autonomous Prefecture, is taking a step forward in terms of environmental protection. The white sailboats exemplify the mission to keep the lake water crystal clean. CGTN's Shang Meng spoke to the local crew about the measures. crew member Yang Tian Chen was born and grew up in Bortala Mongol Autonomous Prefecture. As a local who used to visit Suram Lake as a kid, Yang has had a special bond with it. In 2017, Yang came to know about sailboats. He joined the travel program here at the Suram Lake, taking tourists on the boat to get a better view of the scenery. Every day, Yang makes a routine check on the sailboats, including the body, sail, and outboard model, just to make sure that each is in the best condition to provide a safe and environmentally friendly adventure. Many have heard Seram Lake is highest and largest airplane lake in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. With the help of wind power and clean energy, now I'm on the white sailboat in the middle of the lake, which is just like a mirror of the blue sky. Our sailboats have a hybrid sailing system combining wind power and electric energy, which means it has zero emissions. Seram Lake has a relatively high standard in terms of environmental protection. Other than sailboats, there are also electric SUVs, 
shuttle buses, and wooden boardwalks for pollution-free sightseeing. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit hard the tourism industry, but now things are returning to normal. For Yang, it's not just a cool job to work on a sailboat, but also about making his own contribution to Bortala's tourism industry. He hopes that more and more travelers will get a chance to enjoy the purity and beauty of Saram Lake in the future. Zhang Meng, CGTN, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The head of Libya's UN-recognized government of National Accord Fayyad al-Saraj has announced his willingness to resign by the end of October. The development follows the recent agreement between Libyan factions to have an 18-month transition period that is expected to lead to general elections. CGTN's Adel Makhroui has the details. The man who has enjoyed the backing of the United Nations in Libya since 2015 says he could resign as early as next month. In a televised speech, Faiza Saraj has tied his resignation to the completion and success of the UN-led talks in Switzerland. The UN's mission in Libya says the rival factions are reaching an agreement on how to form a new transitional executive authority. Although I'm convinced that direct elections are the best road to reach a comprehensive agreement, I will be supporting any solution reached through dialogue. I therefore announce my sincere desire to hand over my duties to the next executive authority by the end of October at the most. That's based on the hope that the dialogue committee will have completed its task, formed a new presidential council and cabinet. The Swiss talks are finalizing a vision to restructure the presidential council which Al Sarraj heads and forming a national unity government. Morocco is brokering parallel talks which aim to reach an agreement on the criteria to appoint people who will hold these new top positions. Al Sarraj's resignation will have a good impact on Libya's domestic politics. Internationally, it'll make more countries support the dialogue and the formation of a new cabinet. It will not be in Khalifa Haftar's benefit because there are desires to change all key figures in the West and East. In recent weeks, protests have taken place in both the eastern and western Libyan territories. People have demanded a change in their administrations after government services to the public greatly deteriorated. Although his resignation is conditional to the success of the ongoing talks, Al Sarraj is moving stagnant waters. He has officially announced his goodwill to step aside in Libya's favor. Now all eyes are turning to the Eastern Bloc to see if leaders there will take a similar initiative. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. To South Sudan now, where heavy rainfall has affected almost half a million people in the central region. According to the United Nations mission in the country, flooding of the River Nile had also devastated other regions as well. The commission says that the lakes, uh, lakes and Yongle states have been the worst affected. Heavy rains have caused rivers to overflow in South Sudan, resulting in flooding in vast areas and settlements. In 2019, the United Nations said that an estimated 900,000 people were displaced due to flooding in Yongle, Pibo and Eastern Equatoria regions. To Cote d'Ivoire now, where former Prime Minister Jilom Soro says the opposition must unite in stopping President Alassane Ouattara from winning a third term in upcoming elections. Uh, speaking while in exile in France, Soros says the October polls represent a civilian coup d'etat as the country's constitution states that leaders cannot rule for more than uh, two terms. Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara, however, insists that a change in the constitution in 2016 reset his term and allowed him to run again. Ouattara has been in power since 2010. His decision to run for the presidency has made political observers worried about the threat to democracy in the world's largest cocoa producer. Maintaining these elections makes no sense. Participating in this election would mean support for President Ouattara's civilian coup d'etat. That's why I call for unity of action from the opposition so as to stop Ouattara and his venture by legal and legitimate means. The situation is serious for my country. 
Watara wants to impose another electoral crisis on Ivory Coast after that one in 2010. He is determined, but so are we. Soon or later, our victory will come, and I promise that this victory will be for the Ivorian people, democracy, and the rule of law. Well, let's now go to Rama Nyang for a look at the day's business news, Rama. Thank you very much, Peter. Here's what's coming up in business. South Africa Central Bank pauses its rate-cutting cycle as the economy reopens and pandemic restrictions are gradually lifted. And South Sudan's president is fired the country's eighth finance minister amid an economic meltdown. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's start in the world of monetary policy. As most market commentators and economists had anticipated, South Africa's Monetary Policy Committee has essentially decided to keep the repo rate exactly where it was at 3.5%. The decision, which was announced by the Saab governor, follows the bank's three day MPC meeting in Pretoria. Now, that essentially means that the prime commercial lending rate remains at a more than a 40 year low of 7%. This is part of its response to the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember, the central bank has already cut rates by at least 300 basis points so far this year. Now, the move to hold the repo rate where it is this time round comes just today after President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that South Africa would ease its COVID-19 restrictions to level one over the next month. On to South Sudan. The country's president, Salva Kiir, has fired the country's longtime finance minister. Salvatore Garanga Mabiordit is the eighth finance minister to be dismissed by Mr. Kiir since 2011. He will be replaced by Athian Ding Athian. Now, Kiir has also fired the head of the Revenue Authority and the director of the Nile Petroleum Corporation, essentially the country's state owned oil company. South Sudan is emerging from a civil war that has shattered what little economic activity was there. And this economy, remember, is entirely dependent on oil revenues. At its peak, oil production in South Sudan was about 350,000 barrels a day. But since the signing of a peace deal in 2018, production has risen back up to at least 180,000 barrels a day. But recent plummeting oil revenues have caused, oil prices rather, have caused revenues to decline. Still in Nigeria, the government has uh, pledged to tackle the problem of spiraling food prices amid the devastating effects of the current economic slowdown. Now, a string of challenges ranging from floods to insecurity, drought and the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic have all contributed to a steep rise in the price of food. Here's CGTN's Kelechi Emekalam for that report. Mustafa Ahmed, a rice trader in Nigeria's capital Abuja, is running short of supply. He's been retailing this staple grain for nearly two decades, stocking over 100 bags weekly. But the hike in food prices has drastically affected his business. This also as the purchasing power of his customers diminish due to the COVID-19 lockdown. Before, if I have a one million, I can buy 100 bags of rice. So now, highest that one million, highest she will, highest she will buy 40 pieces, 40 bags. If I had a plan to gain five, 500 naira for each bag, now it's 100 naira. Then the 100 naira I will make at the end. People they are complaining. Some people they come, now hungry, they even disturb them. Before, before, we used to buy rice like 350. But now foreign rice is 1,000 naira. 
even Gwari is 750. Nigeria has been leveraging on the agricultural sector as it diversifies its oil-dependent economy. According to the country's Bureau of Statistics, in 2019 alone, sector investment stood at $490 million, with consistent annual growth averaging 82%. But all these efforts have been hampered by flash floods in major food-producing states. Just recently in Nigeria's northwest Kebi state, which is the highest rice producer in the country, over 450,000 hectares of rice were destroyed after heavy floods swept the region. Rice is the West African nation's staple grain. Several other factors like farmers' insecurity and infrastructural deficit have also continued to hold back the country's agricultural development. What government can do is to ensure the security of farmers. Because when you have good security, people will go back to the farm. Secondly is to um, involve um, the youth, the youth involvement in agriculture. We have less youth now going into agriculture. We have to make agriculture much more um, palatable for them to come into. Um, youth involvement is very important. And also um, capital investment in the agriculture, um, which means um, loans, um, the process of acquiring loans for agriculture is very tedious. If governments can um, ensure that um, loan um, process, acquiring loan um, is very easy and is um, less stressful for people to even assess loan. Nigeria imports nearly $4 billion worth of rice and wheat annually due to its underdeveloped manufacturing industry. To improve the country's agricultural sector, the central bank has banned foreign exchange on importation of rice and other foods. Talks with Food Producers Association and other stakeholders are underway to tackle this rising food crisis. Kilechi Emekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. Now, one of the major challenges that does face small and medium-sized manufacturers over in China is how to improve their efficiency through tech. The Alibaba Group has rolled out a new smart manufacturing platform that's aimed at helping tens of thousands of small vendors get access to the latest cutting-edge digital solutions. Here's CGTN's Wule with that story. Garments are one of the major sectors of consumption in our daily lives. With more shops striving to grow again through the pandemic, small and medium manufacturers face more challenges in this fast-changing digital era. We are facing a lot of changes in design, production and sales. And like the past, our customers today require more tailor-made designs and patterns. While many influencers are turning to live streaming platforms to boost the business, they've found their manufacturing and supply chains are finding it hard to play catch up. I often got some complaints from my followers. They ask why their clothes have not been delivered yet. The delivery is too slow and need more flexible production partners. Most online sellers are busy dealing with design, manufacturing, promotions and after-sales services. How to use digital solutions to ease their burden has become a pressing issue. On September the 16th, Alibaba Group launched a new smart factory platform called Reno that offers smart manufacturing, data analytics and back-end technology to manufacturers so they can customize and fine-tune factories in response to consumer demand. We're aiming to provide smart manufacturing as a service so that those who are good at design, selling, and maintaining followers can have more time to do their jobs. Alibaba's new manufacturing platform has been operating under wraps for the past three years. They've cooperated with over 200 small manufacturers to help adapt to changing consumer needs in a slowing economy. Take this smart production line, for example. It has been equipped with smart cameras, print heads, and other machines to best use data, offering customized, fashionable, and quality clothes. This smart factory aims to enable small businesses to be competitive in a fast-paced fashion market by shortening delivery time and reducing the need to hold inventories. Our hope is to continue to expand Rhino manufacturing, to create an inclusive, win-win, and open digital collaborative network, 
serving 100,000 businesses and forming a trillion-level digital intelligent manufacturing ecosystem. Under the current slowing economy, more smaller Chinese manufacturers are being forced to adapt. And one thing that's expected is combining digital technologies with consumer insights to parse data and automate logistics. Wu Lei, CGTN, Hangzhou. On to the world of tech now. The U.S. President Donald Trump says he's not ready yet to sign off on a partnership deal between TikTok and Oracle. Mr. Trump said that the administration officials would report to him about the deal later on today. The president has cited national security concerns in uh, trying to ban TikTok operations in the United States. And he says he will implement that ban unless its American operations are sold to a locally owned firm. Bloomberg is reporting that the deal on the table would essentially give Oracle full access to TikTok's source code so that the app's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, won't have any backdoors to get access to millions of users' data. Still in the United States, the Federal Reserve decided to hold interest rates near zero, and it's going to be there for a while to come. Policymakers on Wednesday voted to delay tightening until the United States gets back to maximum employment and inflation at around 2%. Here's CGTN's Nick Harper with this report from Washington, D.C. Out of Wednesday's meeting, the Federal Reserve provided perhaps the longest-term outlook that they have so far since the pandemic began. Interest rates, of course, was the big one that everyone was watching. The Fed slashed them to near 0% earlier this year when the pandemic began to try and counter the effects of the economic fallout. And the, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, said during the course of this meeting that he didn't see interest rates changing any time soon, potentially not until the end of 2023. He said there was still a long road to recovery and many things that had to happen first, and therefore there was no need to change interest rates. Before they do any type of change on the interest rate front, they want to see inflation rise, getting nearer to their 2% target. And they don't see that happening until the the end of 2023. We expect that the economy will recover quickly now, but that that pace will slow as uh, as people go back to work and we'll still have an area of the economy, a big area of the economy that struggles. There'll be slack in the economy. Uh, the economy will be below maximum employment, below full demand, and that will tend to wear put to put downward pressure on inflation. He said that the unemployment rate currently at 8.4 percent would probably drop to 7.6 percent by the end of this year, reach about five and a half percent by the end of next year. By the time we get to the end of 2023, he said the unemployment rate in the U.S. would be around four percent. So things are heading in the right direction, but it's still nowhere near where we were at before the pandemic hit. The unemployment rate in February in the U.S. was at three and a half percent. Jerome Powell went on to say that the economic downturn that the U.S. is experiencing is the most severe in our lifetimes and that the path ahead remains highly uncertain. Simply put, the Federal Reserve very much saying that the road to recovery will take some time to come. Nick Harper, CGTN, Washington. And I'll leave it there for the time being, but I'll be back at the top of the hour. We'll be exploring South Sudan's economic meltdown. It just keeps intensifying. President Kira's options for steadying the ship what are they and what fundamental policy changes are needed in Africa's youngest country? Allow the details on that live from Juba and plenty more at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And uh, we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. We'll be looking at the history of Ghana's Kente cloth. The greatest journeys the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allowed the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah! So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference.
local Ghanaian cloth, Kente, has widely portrayed the country's pride and heritage for centuries. In the U.S., it has long been worn by the African-American community during important ceremonies like graduations. In June, U.S. lawmakers wore Kente cloth as they looked to pass a bill on police reforms following the death of George Floyd, an African-American who died in police custody. This led to an increased interest in the cloth. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai tells us more about the Kente's significance and history. Footwork and hand coordination, both vital ingredients in the making of the indigenous Ghanaian cloth, Kente. Samuel Bampo has been weaving since he was a child. Now at the age 72, he still makes a living by producing these colorful cloths. <laughs> One cannot learn how to weave the kente within six months. It takes many years to perfect this craft. There are lots of designs and you need to keep them all in memory. We don't have the designs on paper to serve as reference. The kente cloth is part of the heritage of the Ashanti people in Ghana and was initially worn only by royalty. Ordinary Ghanaians now wear it during special occasions like weddings. Each block pattern and color has a distinct name and meaning. We made this design in celebration of the love between Kwame Nkrumah and his wife Fatia. We named it Fatia Befits Nkrumah. These strips of kente are joined together to make the full cloth. Legend has it that a spider spinning a complex web inspired the earliest kente techniques and designs and you can see why. A lot of precision and mind work is required to weave the cloth. One like this can take up to two days to make. Weavers say they take two months or more to make six yards of the kente cloth. A full cloth can be sold for as much as $350, depending on its designs and colors. We import all the threads we use for weaving the kente cloth. This makes it very expensive to produce. It could be less expensive if we're able to produce the threads locally. The traditional weaving of kente cloth has existed since the 11th century in Ghana. It has defied any form of technological innovation. Samuel says, despite the advanced technology in cloth making, the handmade kente cloth should continue to be preserved to protect the Ghanaian heritage. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. And your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead. The sports world reacts as former IAAF head Lamin Dia is jailed for corruption. How would you create 